Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 336 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, and I'm pleased to announce a new service offering from ACS. It is the Compliance Alliance, which is a three-step process to provide you and your team a background into compliance in the FCPA so that you can consider how your product or service fits the needs of a, of a compliance officer. It includes a boot camp for your executive leadership or sales team, sponsorship of a 30-day podcast series, and in-person training. Interested parties should contact Tom Fox at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Today I have back with me James Kukios, a partner at Morrison and Forrester, and he talks about the firm's April 2017 top 10 developments for anti-corruption across the globe. Uh, we focus on three key developments from April. They include the <coughs> Pascal Dubois being elevated to the head of the World Bank's uh, integrity uh, group. And James explains what that group does and how it works with uh, prosecutors around the globe. We take a look at a firm that was debarred by the World Bank, Concia Consultants, and James explains that process. Then we take a look at a former di- um, di- diplomat from the Dominican Republic who pled guilty to FCPA charges while uh, another gentleman goes to trial. As always, it's a fascinating discussion. James and uh, the law firm of Morrison and Forrester do, Forrester do a great job in putting out this monthly newsletter. This is Tom Fox. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode of F- the FCPA Compliance Report with uh, James Kukios, partner at Morrison Forrester, great friend of the uh, podcast, and <clears throat> he is back as the firm is out with another edition of its most excellent monthly newsletter, Top 10 International Developments for Anti-Corruption the April edition. So with that, James, uh, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to visit with us yet again. Thanks for having me, Tom. So there was a couple of, uh, two or three different ones I really wanted to emphasize uh, this month uh, or on this podcast, James. And the first one was the uh, World Bank brought a change to uh, some leadership positions with uh, Pasquale Dubois becoming the new head of the World Bank's integrity, uh, World Bank Group's integrity vice president. And I was wondering if you might uh, take some time to really explain to the listeners uh, what the World Bank is, but uh, more importantly, how it relates to uh, international anti-corruption and how they have uh, been a group that's really helped foster cooperation between a variety of entities, including law enforcement around the world. Sure. Happy to, Tom. So the World Bank is one of the uh, many multilateral development, multinational development banks out there, uh, probably the most famous one. Actually, right next door to our, our Washington, D.C. office is here at MOFO. Uh, and it, it sponsors a lot of development projects around the world, gives loans and money to to various countries for various development product, projects. And then those countries, um, like any construction project, go out and get companies to to work on those projects. Uh, and the World Bank has a interest in not allowing the money that it gives or lends to these countries uh, to be used for corrupt purposes. So they have several different uh, parts within the bank that deal with uh, anti-corruption efforts. Uh, two of them are directly related to Ms. Dubois. Uh, one of them is her current job, which is the Suspensions and Debarment Office. And the other is the Integrity Vice President, also known as INT, which is currently headed up by Stephen Zimmerman, but which Ms. Dubois will be uh, taking over effective July 1st, 2017. Uh, in many ways, INT is sort of like the, uh, the FCPA unit, uh, SEC or DOJ. It's the investigative function. It, it'll get referrals that perhaps there's uh, uh, some of the mon- World Bank money is being used for corrupt purposes and it will go out and investigate those allegations. Uh, and then once it completes an investigation, it will refer the matter to the Suspension and Department Office, and the Suspension and Department Office will decide what kind of penalty, if any, is warranted for the violation, if there is one. Um, so she's going to now have worked on both sides of that, uh, form, 
now and until July 1st in the uh, in the penalty part of the World Bank and and soon to be in the investigative part of the World Bank uh, as well. Uh, it's a very important anti-corruption body uh, for these reasons. Uh, number one, I mean, there are a lot of these uh, projects are very, very large scale projects and they're almost inherently going to be based on government touch points. So there's in, in all these projects, there's always the risk of, of corrupt purposes uh, being used, the money being used for corrupt purposes. And so the World Bank plays a very, very important role in uh, both investigating and deterring um, corruption in that regard. Now, one very interesting thing is um, uh, when I was at the Department of Justice, it, I w experienced this firsthand, but also they're very public about this. Uh, the integrity vice president will actually refer or provide evidence to national prosecuting authorities as well. Um, I was had the fortune of being um, interviewing Steve Zimmerman, the current INT vice president, at a panel uh, back in November. Uh, we talked about that at some length, but um, the bank is basically composed of many different member nations. And so the bank takes the position that if it uh, develops evidence that may be a violation of that country, member country's laws, it will provide that evidence to the national prosecuting authority of that country. So when I was at DOJ, we got some referrals from the World Bank. Um, and there was a very famous case in uh, Canada at the SNC Lavalin case, which was really kind of instigated right. uh, by by a World Bank investigation. The, the World Bank provided um, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police with information about uh, some allegations regarding SNC Lavalin. Uh, they went and got a wiretap and and began an investigation of several executives and others. Um, we actually wrote about this in, uh, in a couple of our top tens back in April of 2016, and then again earlier uh, this year in February. Um, so it plays a very important role in that regard to, to both investigate and help other authorities, actual prosecuting authorities, bring cases as well. So it, it plays a very, very important role. There's other things that it does as well, the INT does as well. I mean, it gets out there, it talks about compliance standards, it talks about uh, trying to bring transparency and uh, anti-corruption to to its contracts and things like that, and the suspension environment office obviously works in that regard as well to try to to um, make transactions more transparent and and really spread the uh, the anti-corruption gospel, if you will. Right, <clears throat> and so that leads to another um, component of this month's or the April issue. There was a. Um, <clears throat> a a diplomat pled guilty. Uh, I'm excuse, sorry. There was an engineering firm debarred by the World Bank for bribery in Southeast Asia, the uh, Denmark-based Concia Consultants. And I was wondering if uh, you could tell us a little bit about that case because it sounded just uh, just fascinating. Sure. So the INT, um, the Integrity Vice President, uh, investigated uh, some allegations that this company that you mentioned, Tom, uh, had engaged in some corrupt practices in Indonesia and Vietnam. Uh, the, the Indonesian allegations were that the company made payments to officials in Indonesia to influence contract awards in connection with a World, Bina World Bank financed strategic road infrastructure project there in Indonesia as well as some related uh, allegations. Uh, and the World Bank also investigated and said it found evidence that the company made corrupt payments in Vietnam in connection with the Hanoi Urban Transport Development Project and some other misconduct relating to the what they called the Second Northern Mountain Poverty Reduction Project. Uh, so the INT decided, uh, determined that there had been um, evidence substantiating these allegations and it was referred to the uh, suspension and debarment office, and the suspension and debarment office determined that the company should be debarred from World Bank contracts for 14 years, and that one of its managing directors should be personally debarred for doing bank, uh, business before the bank for three and a half years. So is that unusual for uh, the World Bank to debar an individual uh, it's clearly within its its um, its ambit, and it, it does happen. So one thing in here really intrigued me because I have to admit, frankly, I wasn't aware of it, and it's something called an agreement of mutual recognition of debarments. Could you explain to the audience what that is, James, and how it works? Sure. As we talked a little bit uh, at the beginning of the podcast, the 
Uh, World Bank is one of many multilateral development banks. And uh, several of the other banks have, uh, or the banks have gotten together and decided, hey, if you, uh, if you debar one of uh, your contractors, we may debar that uh, contractor as well. Uh, and the idea there is to really make it so that no company will benefit from, um, from corruption uh, from any multilateral development bank project and to try to really um, make it so that the punishment goes across all the development banks. And that was an agreement that was actually reached back in 2010 for the multilateral development banks. Uh, so it's the company's eligible; it's not automatic, um, and, and so but that could happen to this company that was debarred by the World Bank. Uh, other banks like the African Development Bank, uh, the um, and others could also debar the company as well. Which obviously, if that's your business, if you're doing business in in kind of these big bank related construction projects, that could be a real severe penalty. So there's a couple of other things that I thought were uh, pretty interesting in uh, this month's report. <clears throat> you have um, a uh, report on uh, Francis Lorenzo, a deputy, a former deputy ambassador from the Dominican Republic, who pled guilty to uh, conspiring to violate the FCPA. And you also note that uh, one of the other defendants uh, has filed, a, um, or rather the judge denied, a motion to dismiss uh, against uh, – one of the other defendants wondering if you might be able to just kind of walk us through that and what you see that would be significant for the uh, compliance practitioner out of these cases. Sure. So this is a uh, this is an interesting case. It was brought quite a while ago, uh, originally in the Southern District of New York, still in the Southern District of New York, but originally just brought by that U.S. Attorney's Office on uh, domestic bribery charges. Uh, it was very interesting for those of us in the FCPA space to uh, to read that, especially those of us who were former FCPA prosecutors and know that uh, the fraud section here in D.C. has exclusive jurisdiction for bringing FCPA cases, that a case involving the United Nations, uh, which is a, a public international organization for purposes of the FCPA, and therefore its officials are considered foreign officials under the FCPA. It's very interesting that only the Southern District of New York was involved and that there were no FCPA charges, just domestic bribery charges brought in that case. Um, and so originally when the, that was brought, several defendants pled guilty to the original charges, including Mr. Lorenzo. Uh, well, most likely as a result of some uh, internal DOJ politics, uh, eventually FCPA <laughs> charges were brought in that case, and an FCPA prosecutor from Washington was involved. And there were additional, as I mentioned, uh, against, uh, I, I can't, I've got to be honest, I can't pronounce his name, but his last, his first name, I think is Sang, right. uh, the, the Chinese national, uh, FCPA charges were eventually brought against him. Uh, and so what's interesting is Mr. Lorenzo actually pled guilty last year to the original charges. And now he's pled guilty to additional charges, including FCPA charges, probably because speaking as a former prosecutor, you like it if your cooperating defendant has pled guilty to the same charges that you're going against uh, the defendant who's going to trial. Uh, it's kind of a just reinforces at least optically to the jury that, hey, this guy who's testifying has pled guilty to this charge. Uh, and so that reinforces the fact the person who's on trial also is guilty of those uh, those charges. Just a little parallelism that I think prosecutors like. Um, so he pled guilty to those additional charges and is expected to probably testify against, uh, I'll call him Mr. Sang, uh, at the trial. Uh, the trial was originally supposed to go at the um, very end of May, uh, May 30th, but here we are in June, so I guess I'm already spoiling my next top 10. But uh, <laughs> at, the very, at the very last minute, uh, the trial was continued uh, at the government's request because apparently some classified information came up. Uh, and the department needed a little bit of time to deal with the, the classified information. There's a, whenever classified information is, is potentially um, uh, at issue in a trial, there's a, a statute called the Classified Information Procedures Act, uh, which is very complicated. I was involved in several cases involving, it's called SEPA, uh, SEPA litigation, uh, the James Giffen case, for example, and some others, right. uh, they take a very long time. It can take a very long time to resolve. This one always looks like it's going to take about, um, according to the department, 30 days to resolve. But uh, by the end of June, um, that trial should be 
be going. So I think uh, you, you asked for some some lessons for compliance uh, practitioners, Tom. I think one very important one is to recognize that the United Nations, obviously it's based in New York. So um, when you're dealing with a, um, uh, a UN official, there can be domestic type bribery charges because oftentimes the, the diplomat is going to be involved in, in um in New York, and so there's going to be U.S. jurisdiction, but also because it's a public international organization, uh, there could also be FCPA charges, even if the bribery takes place in the United States. Um, so I think it just goes to highlight some of the um, special risks that are involved when dealing with United Nations contracts. And obviously, those can be very lucrative as well. Um, there's been several cases, for example, the the oil for food cases that really kind of kick-started the modern era of FCPA enforcement were United Nations cases. Um, not all of them were brought as FCPA cases because uh, not all of the uh, there wasn't ju- FCPA jurisdiction for a lot of them. They were brought as wire fraud cases, uh, but for some of those cases, there were some FCPA related charges as well. So it just kind of highlights uh, when you're dealing with some of these organizations like the United Nations or other multinational organizations like that, there can be a, a variety of risk areas uh, when you're doing business there. So was the uh, if I could go into the weeds just a little minute was the jurisdictional basis uh, against at least Mr. Lorenzo because the actions happened physically in the United States even though he was uh, or apparently a Dominican uh, citizen of the Dominican Republic. Sure, there are a lot of defendants in that uh, case, Tom, and as I understand it as well, Mr. Lorenzo though he was a uh, and and I. I should say I'm only knowing this from what I've read in the paper, but uh, it appears that Mr. Lorenzo is actually not only a diplomat from the Dominican Republic, but also a U.S. citizen himself. So there could be many different theories of jurisdiction in this case. I think you're exactly right. Some of it is based on the fact that the activities took place in the United States, but it also looks like there were U.S. citizens involved in some of the uh, alleged bribery as well. James, I'm really glad uh, that you were able to highlight the United Nations component of this because um, I was trying to find it online quickly, but I couldn't. There's a specific list of entities that the FCPA covers, uh, NGO entities across the globe. The UN is one of them. The World Bank is one of them. One that is not on the list is FIFA, which is why at least one of the reasons I would speculate there were no FCPA charges brought uh, in the FIFA case. But... um, there's a specific list of entities, and I think that uh, compliance practitioners often uh, don't realize that uh, many of these NGOs may be specifically named in the FCPA. That's right, um, and it, it, it's uh, it can be a very interesting um, uh, issue to look into, at least for FCPA nerds like myself. <laughs> uh, but well, yes, well, it all goes. Yeah, it all goes back uh, the definition of public international organization in. Um, the FCPA incorporates other statutes, uh, another statute where that term is defined. And long story short, um, the president is able to name which organizations are considered public international organizations. So you have to go back and look at executive orders and things like that. And what I didn't know, I was recently um, researching this issue for another case, uh, and and some some organizations that you think would be no brainers. You, you mentioned FIFA, Tom. It's obviously a, um, a international organization, but it's not been designated by the any president as being a public international organization. But some other ones that you would think would be no brainers, like Interpol, for example, it's not so clear. And if I may digress for a moment on this, because I found this personally very interesting as the FCPA nerd that I am. Please do. Um, under the original statute that the FCPA incorporates. Uh, the it, it's an immunity statute for uh, public international organizations uh, that are actually physically located in the United States. So the idea is you don't want to you want to have immunity for things like the United Nations and, and things like that. Um, you don't want to have them be subject to liability for for a variety of things. And so the um, so the president can say, OK, that organization is designated a, a, a public international organization for purposes of this immunity. Interpol, interestingly enough, uh, in the 1980s, did not have any U.S. offices, and so it was not eligible Mm. to be a public international organization. However, they wanted to have a conference in the United States, and so President Reagan, I believe it was, uh, gave them partial immunity under that statute. 
Um, and so for a long time, Interpol was kind of, sort of, maybe a public international organization, but it was just because of that one conference. Since then, Interpol actually has opened offices in the United States, very small, um, uh, a five-person office in New York, if, I, if I'm correct. And President Obama extended that President Reagan's order to say now that uh, Interpol is based in the United States or has an operation in the United States, it can be a public international organization. So long story short, I found that interesting <laughs> because I'm a bit of an FCPA nerd, as, as I mentioned three times now. Um, but I think uh, the, the long story short is um, when dealing with these type of organizations, uh, there are executive orders out there. There are places on the internet where you can actually research the, them. Just a, a Google search will usually come up with a list of them where you can find them. Um, but it's surprising some that are and some that aren't. And I think the, that doesn't mean that they're risk-free because as, we, as we've seen from other cases like FIFA, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, the FCPA is not the only statute that can uh, reach foreign bribery. The wire fraud statutes, the travel act statute, um, all those things uh, can also be used if there is a hook for U.S. jurisdiction. So it doesn't mean that you're completely off um, risk free when you're dealing with some of these organizations. Um, but it is an interesting note uh, to when you're assessing exactly what the jurisdictional ramifications and what the liability risks are. And James, really, the key uh, for me and what you said there was when you assess your risk. <clears throat> because uh, any government touch point that's going to have an FCPA component, uh, uh, your risk would go up, at least your FCPA risk. And just because your risk goes up doesn't mean you can't do business with those people or, you know, um, transacts with those people. It just means you have to manage that risk more robustly uh, with an appropriate level of compliance program uh, in place. So by making that assessment and knowing that you have an FCPA risk, it really helps the <clears throat> practitioner guide the business unit going forward. So I really did appreciate the way you phrased that as uh, assess your risk going forward. Yep. And and just because, you know, as we said, Tom, just because it, there's maybe no FCPA risk, there could be UK Bribery Act risk, there could be a wire fraud risk. So it's important to consider all those things going forward. Your response to those risks, as you said, Tom, might be a little different depending on exactly which risk you face, uh, but it's very important to make that assessment. James, I'd like to close with uh, one of the uh, other points that was in the uh, April newsletter, and it was the uh, remarks by Attorney General Sessions. And I want really, uh, I don't want to ask you about uh, the remarks because you've got uh, got the link to the remarks and they speak for themselves. I, of course, was very gratified that he came to a compliance event, uh, the Ethics and Compliance Institute, specifically spoke to the compliance community, talked to compliance officers, I thought, directly. But what I really wanted to get from you is a sense of when, when the attorney general gives these kinds of remarks, what does it mean to somebody who's still at the Department of Justice? And then conversely, now you in private practice, what does that communicate to you as someone who represents companies really in the compliance field? Sure, Tom. Uh, were you actually at that conference? I was or not. Or did you just read the? You were not. Gotcha, gotcha. Read yeah, it was uh, interesting remarks. Um, you know, one of the big questions has been since since President Trump was elected, was going to be what is the future of FCPA enforcement under a Trump administration? Uh, obviously, he famously criticized FCPA enforcement back in 2012 in connection with the Walmart case. Um, and so a lot of people are wondering, is this still going to be a priority? Is white collar crime in general going to be a, a priority? Uh, and so I think when, when um, the attorney general or somebody from the criminal division goes out and says, you know, basically, this is still a priority for us. Uh, we are still going to enforce the statute. It's the law of the land and it's important for a variety of policy reasons. Um, I think it, it, it makes it uh, clear that people should continue going down the same path that they have been for the last 10, 15 years, um, doing the things that we just talked about, Tom, assessing your risk, uh, building compliance procedures, um, doing your diligence when you're dealing with third parties and things like that. Basically, that the, the landscape is not going to change radically, and all the good processes and procedures that you've built into your compliance program uh, should, should stay there, and you should continue to evolve them and continue to refine them and make them more sophisticated uh, because FCPA enforcement is, is here to stay. I mean, it, it's going to change at the margins. It always does, even within the Obama administration. Um, when there was a change in the, in the leadership within the Obama administration, there can be changes in, at the margins. But I think the, the overall message, Tom, is that um, 
especially with Mr. Sessions, who's been very, as he said, in his early days, um, very focused on violent crime and immigration crime. That doesn't mean other crimes aren't important either. And we're going to continue down the path that, that the Republican and Democratic administrations have been going down for the last 10 or 15 years. So, James, as always, it's been a real pleasure to visit with you. The, uh, the newsletter is incredibly informative. It is the Morrison and Forrester Top 10 International Anti-Corruption Developments for April 2017. If you don't subscribe, I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes, and you should subscribe to it because it's one of the great resources out there. I forgot to mention that it's free. Uh, of course. And uh, James, is always uh, a pleasure to have you come in and talk about some of these issues in detail and really go into the weeds on uh, some of these uh, issues that uh, you and I don't get to explore too often enough. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate us as it would help in our rankings and also help get the word out about one of the top podcasts in compliance. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I look forward to visiting with you again. I hope you will tune in.